The story you're about to hear was told to me in the strictest of confidence. Certain names, dates and locations may have been changed to protect that confidence. Events that feature in this story may be part of the public record. If you believe you recognise any of the people, places or events that feature in this story, I ask you not to reveal any information publicly out of respect for the subject's right to remain anonymous. My name is David Paul Nixon, and this is the New Ghost Stories podcast, where we delve into the New Ghost Stories archive to hear witness accounts of the supernatural. Stories that could be delusions, lies, fantasies, or perhaps even the real thing. Just don't make your mind up until you've listened. It's important never to underestimate the power of the human mind and our incredible capacity for self-deception. We live in a time where we have more information at our fingertips than ever before. We have more access to sounds and images than ever before. And yet, the number of people who believe the earth is flat is on the rise, as too is the number of people who believe our governments are controlled by a cabal of satanic pedophiles. Many of those people believe in both. Now you would think that disproving these kinds of wild ideas would be easy. The evidence is out there. You can present it to people, explain it to them clearly, and then they'd surely change their minds accordingly, right? If it were only that simple. There are many reasons that people believe strange things. They could be the victim of a clever con. They could be caught in a loop of misinformation Stoked by today's manipulative technology, they could just be too stubborn to admit that they are wrong. But preeminent amongst their reasons is that they want these things to be true. And you might ask, why would someone want something as awful as a ruling, satanic, paedophile, ruling elite to be true? The strange answer is that they get something out of it It may offer an explanation for our unpredictable, unjust and unequal world. It may provide the justification to lash out at figures of authority, to define complex frustrations as something horribly tangible. It may allow people to feel as though they have the answers, that they can do their own research and find out even more truths and share those truths with others. They become part of a special elite group that gets it and who really understand what's going on. And now they have both purpose and community. Not so long ago, I watched a large crowd of anti-vax protesters entering the London Underground. From their perspective, they were fighting the most serious battle imaginable against governments and corporations who were taking away their freedom and forcing them to be injected with a form of poison. It was a battle between good and evil. And yet, the mood of the protesters was celebratory. They seemed like they were having the time of their lives. In a conversation I had recently, someone suggested that this was a podcast for believers in ghosts. Now I took issue with this. What I do with the new Ghost Stories podcast is to present personal witness testimony. Testimony that I believe to be truthful. I test the honesty of each witness but evidence that is only from one person's perspective. I invite the audience to make the final judgment. It's literally in the intro of every episode. The fact that I don't invite a counterpoint onto the podcast for each case is not because I'm siding with the subject or the believers. What I offer is one person's experience, what they believe happened to them. So with this month's episode, I thought it might be an interesting exercise to examine the case from a skeptic's perspective. Believers will often ask sceptics to be open-minded, so perhaps this is a good opportunity to ask believers to be critical. The sceptic's case for ghosts not existing certainly has its persuasive arguments. We do have our incentives to believe. If there are ghosts, then death is not the end. There is the possibility of life eternal. If we have lost someone, then we have the hope we may see them again, and that they may be in a better place, safe from the sufferings of life. 
and who of course doesn't love a good mystery. Ghosts unlock great stories from our past. They can offer pleasant terrors. Now I have no reason to doubt today's subject's word, and I'm not suggesting you should be any more judgmental than you would normally be while listening to this podcast. I have as much faith in them as any other subject who I featured on the podcast. They have gone through the same process of scrutiny. But as you hear their story, you will hear them describe their own sadness, how they have needs that are unfulfilled, and the difficulty they have in addressing just how unhappy they have become with their life. And as you listen, consider how this strange phenomena plays into that depression how it offers a form of escape, a way to block out and be protected from the outside world, how this phenomena provides the emotional connection and support that they desire, that they have lacked in their life. This is, however, by no means a straightforward and typical haunting, and it is a rather extreme way for a mind to try and fulfil its desires. Most people with problems in their personal life, no matter how destructive, do not fall into a dangerous and delusional state of personal self-destruction. But delusions can be powerful, and in rare cases extreme. People can come to believe the most bizarre and incredible ideas, and they won't let them go. There is no limit to the mind's destructive potential. I guess it's time to listen and draw your own conclusions. This is case number 149, And it's called The Hoarder, and you can hear it in full after these messages. The New Ghost Stories podcast is supported by Horrified, the website that celebrates and champions British horror, covering films, television, books, fiction and more. You can visit Horrified at horrifiedmagazine.co.uk and find them on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at horrifiedmag. Just to let you know, the narrator of this story is female. Madness doesn't just happen. Not the way people think it does. People think that one day you just snap, but it's not like that. I was thine. I I thought I was. I I really did. I was lonely, I suppose. But I didn't go around feeling sorry for myself. I'm not like that. I have my job. I, I like my job. And I've got friends and I go out. Maybe not as often as I'd like to. The hours at work. I'm a paramedic. That can make it difficult. It's very tiring and some of the things you see can hit you really hard. You don't always feel much like going out, especially when kids are involved. That always hits hard more than anything else when kids get hurt. There was the thing with Tony too. He's he's one of the porters at the hospital. That hit me more than I thought it did. I put my hopes too high for that. Thought it was like a second chance and I let myself get too attached. Let my heart get broken all over again. He he was, is very attractive. And I don't get to meet many men. Not healthy ones with all their bits still attached. We went out, we had some fun. And that's all he was looking for. Some fun. He wasn't looking for anything serious. Basically, I was there and he thought, she'll do for now. And then when he was bored, he moved on to someone else. I've seen him do it to others. He knows how to work it with women. I shouldn't let it get under my skin, but it does. More than I'd like to admit. I don't know why I'm talking about this. You want to hear about the spooky stuff, don't you? What really happened to me? Mad or not mad? Crazy or not crazy? We got a call out this one night late October. I was with Rohit, and we went out on a call to this house out on the blank estate, which is a rough area. We drove to this old house on the end of this road, and the garden there was piled high with rubbish. Police were there, fire service too. You'd think there'd been a major incident, but it wasn't that. The house was stuffed with even more junk. It was a hoarder's house. Everything you could imagine was there. And it was in piles or in bags or in boxes and just all over the place. 
That's why the fire services were there. They were clearing their way through it all. Social services were hanging around as well. They'd come with environmental health officers to see the man earlier. When they got no answer, they checked around the back and smelled the body. Once you know that smell, you don't forget it. You couldn't really get into the house. The back was totally blocked off with stacks of newspaper. There was a really narrow path through the front door, but hardly wide enough for a person to get through. The man was stick thin. Piles of his rubbish had caved in and blocked him in the downstairs bathroom. And there was no window. Poor guy couldn't even get any water because that had been cut off months ago. We were still shifting things out of the way when we got there. We couldn't get the gurney in. So we formed a chain, all of us, carrying stuff out to clear our way in. The most random stuff came out. Bags of newspapers, boxes of tin cans, kettles, toasters, bicycle wheels. Things were all gathered together. His rubbish was categorised. He was weirdly organised. It was hours before we could get the gurney to him. And we barely had half an inch of spare space to move in. But before we got in, we passed this box. It was falling to bits. The person who passed it to me practically threw it at me because they could feel it go. So they just passed the problem on to me. Thanks for that. Stuff was falling out of it. And it was all pottery in China too. I had to just basically guide the thing to the ground so that not everything was smashed. It was all junk, but you have to be careful in case somebody complains later that you broke something valuable. We all try and get money out of you for anything these days. I saved most of it. I didn't look very closely, but things didn't look broken or cracked. Not by me, anyway. But I did see one thing fall out. It was this little china figure. It was the figurine of a soldier. A red coat from the Waterloo Wellington sort of era. His trousers were dark grey, and his hat was black. There was a little feather in his hat, but that had broken off. He had a little brown moustache and two blue dots for eyes under thin brown eyebrows and he had a rifle held to his side. I still don't know why, but the second I saw that figure, I just wanted it. I had a sudden overpowering urge to just reach out and grab it. Can't explain it. And I still don't understand it. I just wanted it. It was so instinctive. I just had to have it. It was as if I dropped my car keys or my phone. My instinct was just to go down and grab it instantly. I wanted this figure so much. I had my hand on it before I'd even thought about picking it up or questioned why I was doing it. It was like I was magnetised to it. But I didn't get to pick it up because the fireman came and said he thought we should have a try at getting the gurney in and Rowett was having a look to see if we could. I didn't say anything about the figure because I wanted it so badly that I was terrified that if someone else saw it, they'd want it too. So I nudged it with my foot into the grass, hoping no one saw me and hoping no one would spot it there. My heart was beating. I was like an addict about to get the next fix. I knew it was there and I had to have it now. I just didn't know why I wanted it. We struggled with the gurney and I found it really hard to concentrate. The only thing that really mattered to me was getting that figure. I couldn't get it out of my head. Rowick could see I was distracted so he took control of things. When you do a job like ours you know when to support each other and help each other out and me and Ro have been doing shifts together for years. He knows me better than almost anyone else. There was hardly anything left of the poor guy. We had to bag him up before we got him out. There were crowds of people in the street by the time we wheeled into the ambulance. That made it more difficult. I had to have that figure and now people might be watching. Worse, they might want it for themselves. I made an excuse to go back and talk to one of the police, because you get to know most of them if you do the job for a few years. And then, just as I was going by, I scooped it up quickly and shoved it into my vest. 
No one saw me, thank goodness. I was stealing from someone's house. I've been doing the job for 12 years and I never stole anything. You can get fired for so much less than a bit of pinching. But I had to take it. I just had to. And not knowing why, in a way, made me want to take it even more because I had to find out why I wanted it. Does that make any sense? I can't believe I'm asking that. None of it makes sense. I hid the figure under the seat and while I was driving back with Roe, all I could do was think about it lying there. What if someone found it, found me out? What if someone took it away from me? I was more worried about losing the statue than I was about being caught stealing. We had a few hours left to do and Roe could see something was up and he asked and I just pretended I was tired and that nothing was wrong. I just wanted the shift to be over so I could get home and put the figure somewhere safe. Well, no one else could touch it. There was a bit of downtime after we took the old man in. While Ro was in the toilet, I took out the figure to look at it. Like I said, it was just some cheap china thing. Not an antique, not even particularly well made. But I was trembling when I had it in my hands. I had stolen it, and I was glad to have stolen it. To have it, it was mine now. No one could take it away from me. I stashed it away for the rest of the shift, and as soon as it was over, I carefully smuggled it to my locker and into my handbag. I drove home really fast. I was so happy to get it home. I was so relieved. I brought him into my kitchen and put him down on the table. My heart was racing. I stood there looking at him, and more than ever I wondered what the hell I was doing. Why had I just risked my job? To rescue this little man from some hoarder's house. It felt so ridiculous. I actually thought about chucking him away. He looked even more cheap now under the light. Not even nicely painted. But I couldn't just throw him away. I put him on the window ledge amongst the flowers. Then I just spent the evening as normal. It was like I'd been a different person all day. I felt so detached about what had happened like I'd had an out-of-body experience. I was probably in denial about it. Didn't want to think about it. It had all been so strange. I had some wine in front of the telly that night, and I remember as the evening went on thinking about that little man, and how I'd left him there, alone, in the kitchen. It was just a figure, but I felt like I'd left him on his own. I even went to check on him later in the evening before I went to bed. I just stood in the kitchen and stared at him. I'm not sure what I felt then. What was I supposed to do? It was just a figure standing on the window ledge. But I felt strangely better knowing that he was okay. When I tried to get to sleep that night, I had the strangest feeling I wasn't alone in the house. The house was too big for me, really. I didn't really need all that space. I think I thought I might fill it with family one day. But that night I felt a presence. And I couldn't get to sleep because I felt I wasn't alone. I remember going to work feeling worn down and tired the next day. The worst day I could have done that because there was a motorway pile-up. Multiple casualties. And there were families and children. It was one of the worst things I'd ever seen. Everyone I know who works at the hospital has something that gets under their skin. For Rowett, it's anything to do with eyes. He gets this look on his face, he goes blue and looks like he'll be sick any second. Jimmy, another one of the guys, for him it's severed limbs. Unfortunately, you don't get them so often. But for me, it is children. That's common, obviously. Everyone gets gutted when kids are involved. But I struggle to keep it together when there's fatalities with children. It was the great getaway before a bank holiday. Two whole families were wiped out. It wasn't even one of the worst things I'd seen, but it hit me so hard. These kids, crushed to death. You couldn't even see their faces. Yobs and drunks got away scot-free. But not the kids, not the families. I hadn't realised I'd become so vulnerable. I came home from work that night, a complete wreck, trembling, lump in my throat. 
I went into my kitchen and I saw that little man on the window ledge. And I cried. I just completely lost it. And before I know it, I'm spilling my guts out to him, telling him everything, asking him why I put myself through it all when I hate my job, <laughs> hate my life. <laughs> so lonely and so unhappy and miserable and depressed. I wanted to help people. You know, that's why I got into it. Why I started the job in the first place. But it's like the same thing day after day after day. And people, for God's sake, people are so messed up. The things they do to each other. You see the worst of everyone. And you wonder why they deserve help at all. It felt really good to tell him. It was good to get it off my chest. He didn't even have to say anything to me. Somehow I felt some of the burden lifted just by saying all this. Just telling him how I felt was good even though he said nothing back to me. I felt better for doing it. I felt like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. So that's how it started. I go to work, come home, and I'd unburden. I sit in my kitchen and go through the day with him. Tell him everything that had happened, everything I felt, every argument I'd had, every pang of self-doubt and misery. And he just took it all in, soaked it up like a big sponge. Best listener there ever was. Better than all my friends. He wanted nothing from me. He didn't interrupt or start talking about his own problems or go on and on about his kids. He just listened and cared about my problems. Horrible patient, go tell my soldier. See Tony chatting up a nurse, go tell my friend. I started to store it all up, all the things about the day I hated, or got on my nerves, or made me angry or sad. I put them on a list, in my head, and I take them home to my new friend. It was the best part of my day. It got so I spent most of my time in there talking to him. And you know what? It made me happier. Even when I wasn't talking to him, I felt this warm feeling that I was more happier in myself, I think. It was like really good therapy. I felt stronger in myself because I had someone else to turn to. I didn't ask questions about it. I didn't say to myself, why are you doing this? This is crazy. I just thought I was thinking out aloud and that was why it felt good. I didn't ask questions because that was to admit that what I was doing was wrong. And I liked it. That's the truth of it. I liked having someone to talk to, even if they weren't real. It felt good, and I liked it. He didn't judge me. He didn't lie to me. He didn't patronise me. He paid attention to me and listened to me. He was the best friend I needed and that I didn't have. But there were side effects. Not that I noticed at first. It was a while before I started to feel tired, really tired. When you get emotional, let it all out. That makes you feel exhausted anyway. So I expected that tiredness when I went to bed. But it started seeping into the mornings too. I didn't think anything of it at first. I did a lot of hours of work because, well, <laughs> I didn't have anything else to do with myself. I did start to feel sluggish, fatigued a lot. I just assumed I was overdoing it at work, taking on too many shifts. I just had to cut back. That was the answer. That's how the house started to get in a state. I don't know how it is with real hoarders, but it isn't as if I made a sudden choice that I wasn't going to take the rubbish out and live in filth. It was just that when I came to do things like take the bin out or tidy up the living room or the kitchen, it just seemed like so much effort. And as the weeks went by, things got worse and worse. I wanted to do something about it. I say to myself, you've got to get this sorted out. The place is a state. This weekend, we're going to clear it up. But the more I thought about doing it, the more it seemed like too much hard work and so much effort. I got tired and drained just thinking about it. I couldn't summon up the strength. I didn't get hung up on it because all my worries would just drain away. All I had to do was turn to my friend on the window ledge and he would make it all seem fine. He used to whisper to me. I could only feel what he was saying, but I took comfort in it and I knew that the mess didn't matter, that it wasn't really important. 
wasn't doing me any harm, and I could clear it up later. I liked being with my friend and hearing his whispering words. I was already starting to feel like I hated going to work because we wouldn't be together. The best part of my day was the moment I got home and he would make me feel okay. No anxiety, no stress, no frustration, no anger, no misery. He'd just suck it all in. I'd feel relaxed and calm. It was the only time I would feel relaxed and calm. And back to being myself again. I wanted to be at home more and more. So much that I pulled a few sickies so we wouldn't have to be apart during the day. I was becoming more distracted at work all the time. I was also getting more and more tired. I felt weak and row. He kept having to cover for me. He told me I should see a doctor if I was feeling tired all the time. I just brushed it off, said I wasn't sleeping as much and just needed a bit of time off. My new friend said I didn't need to see a doctor. And that was all right with me. It was just the world outside. It was wearing me down. Then one day I came in looking exhausted and Rose said to me, Whoa, are you okay? You're looking a right state, girl. He didn't mean to hurt my feelings, not Roe. He was just showing that he was concerned. It's just that I've always been sensitive about my appearance. I'm no pin-up, I'm plain as you can see and my weight is always up and down. It's not like I've got much confidence either. The second he said that, I just had to go and have a look at myself in the mirror. And when I saw me, I, I saw that I'd changed. I don't know when the change had happened. But I was so pale now that I looked ill. I was practically going grey. And my cheeks were sunken and the bags under my eyes were heavy. I looked like a junkie who hadn't got their fix and was going into withdrawal. My skin was clammy, sweaty. I looked sweaty and I looked it all the time. The whole day I kept watching people to see what their reaction was when they saw my face. I kept imagining them thinking, what a mess. What has she done to herself? They let her out the house looking like that. I spent the whole shift wanting to crawl into a hole and die. If I'd had a paper bag, I would have put it over my head. When we were out on call, I tried to stay in the ambulance if I could. When I had to go out, I wouldn't look people in the eye. I'd try and almost hide behind my collar, pull it up high so it hid my mouth and at least part of my face. Ro kept asking if I was alright and I'd avoid answering him. It was the longest day. I told all this to my soldier, and he said to me that it was the job that was doing this to me. It was all too much for me. And then can't remember whether he said it or I said it, but the feeling was, wouldn't it be so much easier to never go out at all? I don't think I took it that seriously at that moment. I needed my job. That was all there was to it. If I needed another job, I should get another job. Although I didn't have the energy to do that, that was also too much work. The idea must have stuck because the next day, exhausted as always, I got up and got dressed and stood in front of the doorway. And I just felt this enormous feeling of dread. Palpable dread. Like something terrifying, petrifying was beyond. And I was so scared of it. So scared that I felt nailed to the spot that physically I could not walk the distance. I was frozen to the spot. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want the world to see me any more. And his words found their way into my head. It would be better if I just stayed here at home. I didn't need the rest of the world. I could shut them out. I'd be much safer just here at home, on my own with him. I didn't need anyone else. No one else really cared. It just made sense at the time and I would have taken any excuse not to leave the house at that moment. I called in sick. My hands were trembling as I did it, but I did it. And that was it. The beginning of my new life. I wouldn't have to worry about what I looked like. I wouldn't have to worry about anything. I felt so much better at home anyway. Besides the tiredness and the fatigue, I was so much happier talking to him and being with him than I ever was anywhere else. I first told work I had the flu. 
Then I called to say I had tonsillitis. I knew that would buy me a couple of weeks off without being challenged. It's pretty common. But after a while, I stopped calling up. Coming up with a lie. Talking it through with them. Even that was too much effort, too much hard work. Just the thought of it filled me with dread. So I just stopped calling them. They started to call me, of course. But I didn't answer. I couldn't bear it. I couldn't summon up the will or the strength to speak to them. I went to sit in my chair. And that was how I spent most of my days. Sitting down. Snoozing. Half awake, half asleep. I was so tired, I hardly ever moved. I'd only move if I needed to drink or eat something. Then I'd shuffle into the kitchen. And I'd see and feel him there. And I'd feel fine. That was really good because it made sure if I had any doubts about what was going on, he would take them away. If for a moment I had doubts about my miserable, isolated existence, he'd just lift them and I'd feel good again. He was happy there in the kitchen. He didn't seem to want to move with me. I took him into the living room a few times to talk to, but he always preferred to stay in the kitchen. It became harder and harder to get in there. You'd be amazed at how quickly the rubbish piles up. It started to stink in there. I hated the smell, but I didn't have the will or the energy to do anything about it. And strangely, I knew he preferred it how it was. So I just left it. The only other times I left my chair in the living room was to go to the toilet and to bed, although it became more of a struggle to get up the stairs. I was lucky I had a downstairs bathroom. Eventually I stopped going upstairs at all. Almost everything felt like too much effort. As the weeks went on, I hardly washed. I hardly changed my clothes. I didn't like being this way, feeling so unclean, so dirty. But it was all too much work. And if I ever felt wrong or worried about my condition, all I had to do was see my friend and he'd make everything all right in my head. Then I could sleep soundly again for hours. I had to eat, of course. So once in a while, I forced myself along to the corner shop. The time between trips going there got longer and longer so I was always buying tinned food. And when I walked back home, I would sometimes pick things up. Bits of rubbish, cans, bottles, cardboard boxes. He liked those. I knew he would appreciate me adding these things to his collection. I used to eat food straight from the can. That was easiest. It wasn't as if I could get into the kitchen to use the cooker anyway. I didn't know it, but I was creating a prison for myself. I had to be able to move around in my own home, even if I never moved around much, so the junk, the stuff, would have to go where I didn't go much. So I started to pile it up around doorways and up against windows blocking out the light. As the weeks went by, I saw sunlight less and less. Only through the kitchen window, where he stood, was there any natural light, and the only exit from the house unblocked was the back door. He was my gatekeeper. I only went out when he said it was safe. I could hear sounds from the kitchen. I thought it must be rats. It was filthy in there. Rubbish piled high. I wasn't so far gone that I didn't know that rats were disease-ridden and dangerous. But he kept saying it was fine, that there was nothing to worry about, that I would never be harmed while he was here to keep me safe. But the sounds would get louder. I swear sometimes I would hear things shift and move about, not things moving amongst the rubbish, but actual rubbish being moved around. I wondered to myself, just how big are these rats? Then eventually, one day, I was just lying in my chair when there was a loud knock at the door. I always ignored it when people knocked. I didn't want to see anyone. But I knew the voice. It was Rowett. I like Rowett. He did mean something to me. I'd almost forgotten him. But when I heard his voice, it really did wake me up. How long had it been since I had spoken to Ro? I dropped out of my chair and began to crawl along the floor. He was banging on the door as I made it into the hall. I could hear him shouting to someone. He was shouting, What the hell's wrong with this place? What's going on? And he was thumping on the door. Have you seen this? Karina, are you in there? He opened the letterbox to look in. I crawled back to the living room. I don't think he saw me. I didn't want him to see me. Got to hear his wife's voice too, but couldn't make out what she was saying. 
Look at the state of the place. Something's wrong here, seriously wrong, he shouted to her. I wanted to answer him. Ro and me, we'd been working together for years. We'd been through some bad stuff, seen some bad stuff. I really cared about him. I really liked him. He was one of the best friends I had. Now that he was here, that he'd come to me and was worried about me, I found that I wanted to answer him. I wanted him to know that I was okay. I wanted to talk to him. But I couldn't. I opened my mouth and I couldn't speak. I didn't have the strength. I'd lost my voice. I couldn't speak anymore. I couldn't talk. I lay against the wall, my mouth opening and closing with no sound. He went away eventually. I wanted to answer him, but I just couldn't. My voice was gone. And I was upset. So I did what I always did when I was upset. I went to talk to my friend. As I was crawling in there, I wondered how long it had been since I actually had spoken. When I spoke to him now, did I really speak? No. No. It was more like he just knew what I was saying, and he knew just how to calm me down or reassure me, or tell me to just go back to sleep. I went in on my hands and knees. I couldn't get into the kitchen. There was too much rubbish. I couldn't see him. But I knew he was there. What had happened to me? Where was my voice? He said it wasn't important. I didn't need to speak to him. He knew me better than I knew myself. What words needed to pass between us? But what about Ro? I wanted to speak to Ro. He was my friend. I didn't need friends. I had him. What did I need Ro for? We had each other. We needed no one else. Normally, that would be enough. I would crawl back to the living room and into my chair, but Ro, Ro was more important to me than that. It was as if I'd forgotten him until that moment. He'd been blotted out of my memory. I'd forgotten a lot of people. I had pictures of lots of them, but they were lost now in the rubbish. I didn't like to think too hard. It hurt my head. I couldn't let it go, though. What was wrong with talking to Ro? Why couldn't I talk to Ro? Ro didn't understand us. I didn't need him. Why did I need him? Why was I letting Ro come between us? He was angry with me. He wasn't angry with me often. When he was angry with me, I didn't dare argue. I just went back to the living room and lay on the carpet. He'd imprisoned me and I didn't even know it. I didn't even know it, but it started to sink in after the thing with Ro. Was it later that night or was it the night after? The days and hours meant nothing. I don't know how they passed or how often they passed. I woke up and I found myself crawling to the bathroom. I had been dreaming about Ro. I couldn't let it go. Why couldn't I speak to Ro? I knew Ro cared about me. I went to the bathroom and put my hands on the sink. It took so much effort, I managed to pull myself up and look at my reflection in the mirror. I had no idea how long it had been since I looked at myself. I never changed my clothes, so I never saw my body beneath them. But when I looked into the reflection, I knew I was dying. I was like a skeleton. My hair was falling out. My skin was almost hanging off my bones. I looked like I was dead already. The shock. It was so bad I fell down on the floor. Gasping for air, I was panicking. I passed out. It was too much for me. I woke up some time later, trembling. I was dying, I knew it. I could barely roll over. It was like being woken suddenly from a dream. There was almost nothing left of me. I wondered if I fell asleep again whether I'd even wake up. I managed to turn over and pull myself forward along the carpet. I was facing the kitchen, piled high with rubbish. I could hear the rats moving again, and then I could see the rubbish moving. The rats couldn't be that big. There was something else in there, something growing, taking shape, moving. What it was, I don't know. But I was frightened and I tried to move myself across the floor. I started to wriggle like a worm, pulling myself up slowly on my elbows. All the time I could hear his voice telling me everything was okay, that I shouldn't rest, that I should sleep. There was no need to fuss, no need to struggle. I fell flat down on the floor again in the hall. That was what he wanted. He wanted me to die so he could live. 
That thing in the kitchen, that was him. He was coming to life, and I needed to die so he could live. The old man, the hoarder, he hadn't been enough. He had died by accident before my man could suck him dry of all that he had. But now he had fed off me for God knows how long, and he was becoming whole. He was becoming real. I drifted off for just a moment, and in that moment, I dreamt about him rising up, rising from amongst the junk and the rubbish, stepping forth like some Adonis, smiling at me for giving birth to him. He came up to me. He picked me up off the ground. I was light as a feather. He swung me around like we were in a kind of waltz. My feet never touched the ground. He pulled me close. He stared deep into my eyes. He kissed me. Then he snapped my neck. I woke up staring at the front door. There were piles of junk in front of it. How could I reach it? How could I get the strength to pull it open and escape? He would never let me. He would never let me go. The door was barely two metres away, but it might as well have been miles. I was trapped and there was nothing I could do. I lay on my back looking at the ceiling, trying my hardest just to stay awake. I don't know what triggered the idea in me, but instantly I knew that it would work, that it must work, that it was my only chance. I struggled hard into the living room, grabbing onto the carpet and pulling myself along. It seemed to take forever, but I made it to the dresser, and it took another age before I pulled myself up against it and managed to open one of the drawers. Inside, it took not too much searching to find what I'd been looking for. Matches. I slumped back to the floor and pulled myself along to the kitchen. The rubbish was now spilling into the living room. Still lying on the ground with just a flick, I lit a match. He said to me, You wouldn't. Don't be so stupid. I took no notice. Gently, I placed the match against some dry cardboard and ever so slowly the fire caught, and it started to eat it up. He was demanding that I put it out, quite patronisingly at first, like a teacher handing down orders to some stupid child. But I resisted, and the fire it climbed. It grew steadily but surely. He got more angry, started to shout at me, yell at me, but still I resisted. I found that suddenly I was standing again. I was on my feet, my body straightening up to stand. He was giving me strength, letting me have it back, giving me just what I needed to put out the fire. It was growing. He knew my plan now. It was like a game of chicken, and he wasn't going to let me get burnt alive. The smoke was hurting my eyes. The fire was roaring, but he held back, thinking I must give way first. But I was only strong enough to go if he let me, and I knew he would let me, because otherwise who would save him? I knew he'd never just let me go, but he would let me save him from the fire. He had to. He had no choice. He would burn. And like some incredible rush, I had all the strength and energy I needed. I leapt into the flames like there were waves in the sea. I kicked and staggered through the rubbish and pushed my way out of the kitchen, through the back door and out into the garden. Smoke billowed out after me. Almost the whole kitchen was on fire. I was lucky not to be on fire, but my legs were burnt. I could feel it, but I couldn't feel the pain yet. I landed on the grass and rolled on my back. The fire was in full swing now. Black smoke was rising in the air. I lay there for a moment, just breathing, just breathing. He was still clutched in my hands. I was dazed, dizzy, exhausted, weak. But I knew I was still his prisoner. After a few seconds passed, I was back trying to stand again. But I felt my strength already slipping away. I had a rockery. Overgrown now, but I could still see the rocks. And I knew then what to do. I stumbled across the grass. I fell on my knees and then on my face, but I made it to the rockery. I took a deep breath and brought myself back up on my hands and knees. There was a rock. There was the figure in my hands. All I had to do was bring them both together. And when I was almost there, two hands landed on my shoulders, strongly, firmly. They gripped me. My body went still. I froze solid. One hand lifted. It started to stroke my cheek. It ran his fingers over my lips and brushed my chin. The voice said, We can be together always. We can live for each other. I am yours and you are mine.
I will never leave you. For a moment, I felt weak. I felt myself tremble. I felt myself draining away. My back started to sag. My chin started to drop. I will never leave you. But then I drew in a deep breath. And inside I felt myself roar. I opened my mouth and from deep inside I felt it rise up inside me. An almighty scream. I let it out. I was screaming, shrieking, roaring. I raised the figure up and I brought it down. I smashed it against the rock and broke it into a thousand pieces. The next thing I remember is that I'm in hospital. I'm hooked up to all kinds of drips and things. My house was burnt down and I'm in hospital, only just about alive. But alive. I'm alive and he's dead. He's gone. I never saw him or heard him again. So that's it. That's my story. You can believe it or not, that's what happened. Make of it what you want. Thank you for listening to the New Ghost Stories podcast. If you've enjoyed listening to the podcast, please consider becoming a patron by visiting patreon.com slash newghoststories. You can also support the podcast by liking or leaving a review on any platform and subscribing to hear future releases. Today's story features in the book 14 New Ghost Stories, which is available from Amazon, Apple Books, and other book retailers. This podcast is written, presented, and produced by me, David Paul Nixon. If you'd like to read more from me, visit my substack at davidpaulnixon.substack.com. You can find out more about New Ghost Stories at my website, newghoststories.com. And for all the latest updates, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at New Ghost Stories. Next time on the New Ghost Stories podcast, no amount of drinking can make him forget the past. It all comes flooding back with just one tap on the shoulder. Thank you.